1385, the infamous Alexander Stuart, otherwise known as the Wolf of Badenoch, and his band of wild, wicked Heeland men torched Elgin Cathedral and destroyed 500 years of culture and learning. Brother to a king and the bastard son of another, the wolf story is just one chapter in the violent and controversial history of the Stuarts, a clan who won the Battle of the Jeans and began a royal dynasty whose modern descendant is the present British Queen. In this series, I'm going on a personal journey into the ancestral heart of Scotland to reveal the extraordinary stories behind the great clan names of history. And there can be few whose claim to supremacy has more surprises than the family born to be kings, Clan Stuart. The Stuarts were monarchs for over 350 years. And the story of their success is one of good marriages and successful breeding. Of all the names in history, Stuart not only sounds profoundly Scottish, it also captures the essence of royalty. So it comes as something of a surprise to learn that Stuart origins are far from royal and far from Scotland. In fact, the Stuarts are French, and this town in Brittany is where their story begins. Long before the Stuarts began their association with Scotland, their ancestors lived here, in and around Dold, Britannia. Outside the town hall, I met up with local historian Monsieur Cortille, sporting an appropriate tie for the occasion. He was keen to tell me more about the Stuarts' French connection. Les Stuarts ont été les premiers sénéchaux de Dol. Un sénéchal, c'est le premier assistant du seigneur, du comte, et il était chargé de la gestion du personnel et du domaine. Sénéchal se traduit en anglais en Stuart. Qui étaient les premiers Stuart Les premières générations de sénéchaux de Dol s'appelaient Fitzalan. Leurs descendants ont accompagné Guillaume le Conquérant en Angleterre et Fitzalan est devenu le premier Stuart qui a fondé sa dynastie en Écosse. Il est mort en 1177. The Fitzalans were a family on the make, but the real reason behind their move to British shores may have been genetic. They were breeding too fast, and there was simply no room left in Brittany for the younger sons. So they set sail, looking to make their mark on the world. There are very few reminders of the ancient Stuart connection in Dole today, but I have come across a couple. Just over there is the Passage des Stuarts, which unfortunately leads to the public toilets. But perhaps more encouragingly is this bar, Les Stuarts. Santé. Invited first to England by William the Conqueror and then to Scotland by the Scottish King, the Fitzalan ancestors of the Stuarts came here, to Paisley. Now you might wonder why anyone would want to give up the prospect of the good life in Brittany for the cloud and wet of West Central Scotland. But it was here that Fitzalan had the chance of securing land, and with it, the opportunity to found a dynasty. As the king's stewards, a job which gave the Stuarts their name, it was their task to protect the kingdom from the Vikings who were invading from the west. What the Crown was doing was basically taking these guys in areas that their own control was maybe a little bit weak or there were powerful native kindreds um, not paying much attention to the Crown um, and they put these, these new guys in and, and they knew how to uh, organise themselves and keep everyone in, at bay. To meet the Viking threat, the Stuarts took to the seas themselves and pushed further down the Firth of Clyde. They settled the islands of Bute and Arran and established important centres on the coasts of Cowell and Kintyre. 
By the 13th century, the Stuarts had left their French origins behind and were absorbing another culture. To a 13th century traveller from the Lowlands, Butte would have seemed an exotic place, almost like arriving in a foreign country. Everything was different – customs, politics, language and dress – because Butte was a cultural centre, a Gallic cultural centre, and lording over it all were the Stuarts. Butte's once mighty Rossi castle was a centre of Stuart lordship in the Gaeltach, the Gaelic-speaking West. I met up with Steve Boardman from Edinburgh University to find out how the Breton incomers went native. Well, Steve, it's a much bigger space than I imagined. Yes, I mean, in terms of, of the castle of this type, it's, it's actually a, a fairly major fortress around a, a big circular curtain wall. And when the Stuarts came here, they made this a significant power base. The Stuarts used Rossi as, as their means of, of dominating the Firth of Clyde. Uh, it's a tremendous strategic location, uh, guarding the narrow channels between Butte and Cowell. Now, the Stuarts are traditionally thought of as being a lowland clan, and where we are now, Butte was at that time very much part of the Gaeltach. Yes, yes, very much so, and, and I think that's, that's an aspect that perhaps is, is downplayed a wee bit. We, we have a, an image now of the Stuarts as uh, the mature royal dynasty, uh, uh, sitting in Edinburgh or Stirling, distant from, from these west coast uh, areas. But in the 13th and 14th century, we're talking about a family that would have been regarded as, as great lords within Gaelic Scotland. Uh, they would have been uh, looked up to by the men of Butte, by the men of Arran, by the men of Cowell, as their natural lords, uh, as, as the great local figures who offered them protection and to whom they owed service uh, and tribute. It wasn't long before the fast-breeding Stuarts were forced to extend their range beyond the Clyde. Soon, cadet branches of the clan were appearing across the Gaelic-speaking world and beyond. Fertility is vital to the success of any dynasty, and it was precisely this inherited fertility that made the Stuarts royal in the first place. The Royal House of Stuart ruled over us for almost three and a half centuries, but they didn't rise to the top of the heap because they were victorious in the field of battle. Now, the Stuarts were winners in a different area of combat, the Battle of the Genes. Beneath the stone vaulted ceiling of Paisley Abbey, the last resting place of many of the Stuart ancestors lies a clue to the family's remarkable royal success. Lying amongst the bones of the early Stuarts is one tomb in particular I'm very keen to see, and it lies over here against the north wall, near where the old high altar once stood. Now this is the stone effigy of Princess Marjorie, the daughter of Robert the Bruce, Scotland's great hero king and man of legend. Now, the fact that she lies here amongst the Stuart ancestors is really significant because it explains why the Stuarts became royal. The Bruce's son and heir was infertile and died without leaving a son to succeed him. Marjorie, meanwhile, had married into the fertile Stuart family and fell pregnant with a male child. Now, it was through fields nearby that the heavily pregnant Princess Marjorie was riding when she fell off her horse. She was taken into the abbey by the monks, where, tragically, she died giving birth to her son. Now, when he grew to manhood, he became the first Stuart king because he was the closest male heir to his grandfather, Robert the Bruce. I think what really makes the Stuarts get their breakthrough to begin with is the fact that they, they did literally breed for Scotland. There, there are a huge number of Stuarts, particularly Stuart brothers and sons around. So suddenly you're getting a new Stuart aristocracy and this is going to be a way of consolidating the Stuarts' power. So having plenty of brothers or uncles or cousins or what have you works very well to begin with but it could become a problem further down the line. And it was into the highland district of Badenoch that one particularly troublesome son of Stuart Issue came. In 1370, Alexander Stuart, 
bastard teenage child of Robert II, landed in this vast, forbidding wilderness, charged with a royal mission. This is Stuart country today. Six centuries ago, Alexander was given lordship over these lands and expected to exercise royal authority here on behalf of his father, the king. Alexander had youngest son syndrome. He was quick to anger, oversensitive, and had a deep sense of natural injustice. After all, all his brothers were earls, and he was merely a lord, and it simply wasn't fair. So with a chip this big on his shoulders, is it any wonder that Alexander was trouble? Alexander Stuart is, is the youngest of, of Robert II's sons. Alexander maybe feels that he's uh, due more than he actually gets uh, during his father's lifetime. But at the same time, there's indications that he may have been uh, his, his father's uh, favourite son uh, and perhaps uh, most indulged son. Like many younger siblings, Alexander had an uncanny knack of annoying members of his family, and the methods he used to exercise royal authority in Badenoch were a particular cause of friction. Much to the displeasure of his family, Alexander ruled by terrorising the local community and by running protection rackets. He's also said to have fathered up to 40 illegitimate children. It's perhaps not surprising that he's known as the Wolf. The wolf, in, in, for the medieval mind, uh, was a, a symbol of, of, of Satan, a symbol of, of all that was brutal uh, and rapacious uh, in the world. In Badenoch, Alexander exercised power from a chain of formidable castles, like Grim Loch Endorb, high above the Spey Valley, where I met up with Richard Oram to explore the castle known locally as the Wolf's Lair. It was here that Alexander, the bastard son of the king, nursed the grievances that fueled his ambition. He had a lot to prove, and to help him, he called upon the ancient Highland fighting tradition of the Cataran. So here we are, Richard, Loch and Dorb Castle. Big wide space here must have been the, the courtyard, I suppose, and it would have been here that Alexander, the Wolf of Badenoch, would have entertained his cataran. Yeah, this is one of his principal power bases. Uh, this and the castle of Rothendown in, in Badenoch proper. Um, this is the kind of place that he would have been basing himself, the centre of his lordship, and from here he's going to be launching his raids down into the Murray Lowlands. Who or what exactly were the cataran? They're um, the, the military arms of the, the Highland kindreds. They're, they're brought up from, um, from youth as fighting men and they're maintained and supported either through predatory raids onto neighbours or out of the, the produce of, of the rest of the clan. Alexander Stuart, the wolf of Badenoch, using his cataran, was using them for, for what purpose? Right, well, he's been planted in the Highlands by his dad, the king and he's effectively been told to uh, establish a power base up there. And the way the, this was done in the past was through your know, marriage into the local area, you had good, strong connections with the local kindreds. Or alternatively, you use military muscle. You get, um, effectively, the armed thugs on your side. Because the Catherine, they become the boys that get sent round if people step out of line. Um, and he uses these people to slowly but surely establish a position of dominance throughout most of the central Highland area. This may have been an effective way of imposing his authority in the short term, but it stirred up hostility and created an implacable enemy in the person of Bishop Burr, the Bishop of Murray, who described Alexander and his Cataran as wild, wicked, Heland men. The Bishop of Murray was not just a man of the cloth, but a great political wheeler and dealer in his own right. When Alexander tried to extort protection money from the church, the bishop would have none of it, even from the son of a king. In effect, a turf war broke out between the bishop and Alexander. It was about money, about power, and who had the right to raise revenues. It was a battle neither could afford to lose. 
A showdown between these two powerful and stubborn men was inevitable. They agreed to meet face to face at the standing stones of Easter King Yusi. The ancient standing stones which once dominated this site have long since been replaced by this church and this graveyard. But back in 1380, this is where Alexander and the bishop met in a kind of open-air court. Both men were accompanied by a heavily armed following. Alexander with his cataran, the bishop with his knights. But Alexander had bribed the court to find in his favour. Too late, the bishop realised that the whole event had been stage-managed to impress Alexander's followers. Alexander's fortunes were on the rise and his status as a mighty lord was confirmed when he finally received an earldom. This wasn't bestowed on him by the king, but came through marriage. The bride-to-be was the recently widowed Euphemia, Countess of Ross. In plighting their troth, Alexander added the great earldom of Ross to his empire. Alexander's marriage to Euphemia Ross, like all marriages among the elite of Scotland and, and elsewhere in, in, in the medieval West, is nothing to do with love. That's for your, chiv you know, your chivalrous, you know, your romances, and that's certainly not for your wife. <laughs> love between um, husband and wife is not, so, it's not a concept that people in the Middle Ages had any truck with. Um, it was purely about a property transaction. Now you'd think that by marrying well, Alexander would go on and found a legitimate dynasty of his own. He is now Earl of Buchan and Lord of Badenoch, and is at the height of his powers as the greatest landowner in the history of the Scottish Highlands. But he blows it, and all because of a woman. Alexander clearly has uh, a more uh, personally fulfilling uh, relationship uh, uh, with uh, a, a Gallic woman, uh, Mariotta. Uh, and it's that relationship uh, that is uh, what we would regard as the real uh, uh, affectionate relationship in, in, in Alexander's life in the 1380s and 1390s. Alexander refused to end the relationship with Mariotta, and his marital problems soon reached the ears of his old enemy, Bishop Burr, here at the great Episcopal Fortress Come Palace at Spiney, just outside Elgin. Now, the bishop no doubt relished the opportunity to meddle in the marital affairs of his arch enemy. Alexander's marriage was declared an utter failure. He had no heir. He was told to respect the countess and her property and to end the relationship with his live-in lover. This wasn't just spiteful marriage guidance from the bishop. The politics of the realm were at stake. Divorce threatened the Stuart clan with the loss of the great earldom of Ross and their influence in the north. There was no way the king or the rest of Alexander's family were going to tolerate that. Bullied into submission, Alexander surrendered to their terms and promised to be a good husband. There's no question that what happens to Alexander when he is told by the bishops that he's got to go back to Euphemia, that this is a real uh, shaming of Alexander, a public humiliation of him. And you know, he would have needed to very, very quickly reassert his authority. You know, he's been seen to be effectively beaten by a woman. Alexander spent the winter of 1389 licking his wounds and looking for an opportunity to reassert himself. He did so spectacularly with an attack on the jewel in Bishop Burr's crown, Elgin Cathedral, where I met architectural historian Richard Fawcett. Richard, Elgin Cathedral, the Lantern of the North. I mean, this must have been a great centre of learning. Oh, absolutely. Uh, what you have to remember is that there was a staff of about 25 canons here uh, supporting the bishop. These are all university graduates, men of high intellect, and although they didn't spend all of their lives here, they must have brought an intellectual presence to the North that simply wouldn't have been here without them. 
And what did happen on that night in, in June? Well, as you probably know, uh, Bishop Alexander Burr was really seen as the focus of the opposition to the Wolf of Bardenoch. Uh, he simply was not happy at having to pay what amounted to protection money uh, for his uh, cathedral and the properties of the cathedral. So he decided he was no longer going to pay it. And the Wolf of ba uh, Bardenoch was having absolutely none of this. So he descended from Lochindor on the 17th of June, 1390, uh, he set fire to the cathedral, he destroyed 18 of the houses of the canons and also destroyed the parish church as well. And it's obvious from a letter that the uh, bishop sent to the king immediately afterwards that he was utterly, utterly heartbroken by the whole thing. So this, this vast space literally became a Lantern of the North when it was set alight. Absolutely, and it's important to remember, of course, that uh, it would have been relatively easy to set it on fire. What we see around us now, of course, is mainly stone, but there would have been an awful lot of timber here. And, of course, above everything, there was uh, a timber roof. And once the cathedral had been set on fire, there really would have been no stopping it. Is there any evidence of the fire damage that we can see today? Oh yes, there's a great deal of uh, evidence. You can actually see masonry that was damaged by the intensity of the flames and that gives you some idea of just how hot it must have been inside the cathedral. Having given such spectacular vent to his anger, Alexander now had to face the consequences. The church immediately excommunicated him. To save his mortal soul, he had to appear at the high altar of Dunkel Cathedral, where he suffered the indignity of making an apology to his brother the king and to Bishop Burr, dressed only in his underclothes. That type of ceremony, uh, uh, that humbling ceremony, uh, is, is one that's quite often imposed uh, by the church on, on people who have infringed against its, its rights and, and liberties. Um, but it's unusual for an earl uh, to have to undergo that type of, of public penance. Um, and and in, in that sense, it's, it's uh, bound to be seen uh, as, as a, a personal uh, slight and humiliation by, by Alexander. If that wasn't humbling enough, Alexander had to suffer a further humiliation. Euphemia divorced him and he lost all the lands he'd gained by marriage. The wolf was no longer the great power in the north, a fact that pleased his scheming elder brother, Robert. If history has looked unfavorably on Alexander Stuart, then his elder brother, Robert, Duke of Albany, is even less well regarded. Albany was the second son of the king, when the king died, Albany's elder brother succeeded to the throne as Robert III. But Albany was a man of overweening ambition and had a refined intellect to guide it. In fact, his political skills were so acutely honed, he was able to threaten his brother, the king, with an alternative Stuart dynasty, the Albany Stuarts. This is Falkland Palace in Fife. And back in the late 1300s, Falkland was the centre for Albany Stuart power and ambition. The Duke of Albany is, is one of the, uh, the great controversial figures uh, of, of late medieval Scotland, uh, the archetypal wicked uncle. Albany had dynastic ambitions of his own. For years, he'd been the real power behind the Scottish throne, manipulating first his father and then his brother. Now, he wanted to secure the Scottish crown for the fruit of his own loins and secure a royal Albany Stuart dynasty through his son. But there was a problem. Albany's brother, King Robert, had two sons, David and James. These two royal princes stood between Albany's son Murdoch and the throne. Prince David was already being groomed for kingship, and when he was created Lord Lieutenant of Scotland, his new powers were a direct threat to Albany's plans. David is starting to do things for himself, and that is what really worries Albany. Making his own deals, building up his own networks of power, giving himself independence, that's got to be removed. And if it means permanent removal, 
so be it. Albany had Prince David captured and imprisoned here at Falkland, where the quality of care wasn't up to the usual standards for royal prisoners. Albany kept his nephew under lock and key for several weeks. Deprived of food and water, Prince David simply starved to death. One down, one to go. King Robert, old and frail, was devastated when he heard what had happened to his son and heir and moved swiftly to protect his second son, James. But tragically and almost unbelievably, James was captured by pirates and sold to the English king as a hostage. Well, this broke King Robert's heart and he died wishing to be buried on a dung heap. He even wrote his own epitaph, which has gone down in history as the most melancholy. Here lies the worst of kings and the most wretched of men. But the Albany Stuarts ultimately became victims of their own overarching ambition. The exiled Prince James grew to manhood and returned to Scotland. As King James I, he made it his priority to exact revenge on the Albany Stuarts. He had the entire family and all his cousins executed. The dynastic ambitions of the Albany Stuarts died with them. But in the Highlands, King James's cousins, the illegitimate children of the Wolf of Badenoch, continued to prosper, growing ever closer to the Gallic world adopted by their father. Exactly how he met his end is not recorded in history. Instead, the death of Alexander Stuart has become the stuff of legend. According to the story, the wolf received a mysterious guest at Ruthven Castle in the summer of 1394. Dressed all in black, the stranger challenged the wolf of Badenoch to a game of chess. That night, the castle was rocked to its foundations by a terrible storm of thunder and lightning. The following morning, there was no sign of the mysterious visitor, but the horribly charred bodies of the wolf's servants were found outside the castle, apparently killed by lightning. Alexander's remains were discovered in the banqueting hall, and although there were no marks on the body, strangely, all his boot nails had been pulled out. Such are the perils of playing chess with the devil. Of course, the wolf's death wasn't the end of the story. Stuart offspring were now established in the Highlands as a clan and on the throne as the Scottish royal dynasty which may explain why Alexander's final resting place is a little closer to heaven than you might think. And this is his tomb, and lying on top of it, a stone effigy of the man himself. Now, he might be uh, missing a nose, an arm, and a couple of feet, but he still cuts a magnificent figure lying here, surrounded by carvings of his knights, perhaps his cataran. Now, Here's a final irony. Alexander, who was born a bastard, who fathered 40 more, lies here next to where the high altar would have stood, as close to God as it's possible to get on earth. Not bad for a man who was excommunicated by the church. <laughs>